با درود بسیار به بینندگان عزیز برنامه زمان انتخاب من بیژن خلیلی هستم ناشر و مدیر شرکت کتاب و امروز به جای آقای دکتر مهدی آقا زمانی این برنامه رو اجرا می کنم یعنی در حقیقت انتخاب شدم برای زمان انتخاب و انتخاب شدم که با آقای دکتر اندرو اسکات کوپر گفتگوی داشته باشم اندرو اسکات کوپر دوستان عزیز شخصیت ویژه‌ای برای ما ایرانیان چه در خارج کشور و چه در داخل کشور به دلیل اینکه ایشون دو تا کتاب بسیار بسیار مهم تعلیف کرده اویل کینگز پادشاهان نفت و همچنین کتاب The Fall of Heaven زوال بهشت هر دو کتاب البته به زبان انگلیسیه و دکتر کوپر اجازه بدین یک معرفی کوتاه از ایشون بکنم ایشون روزنامه‌نگاری رو یعنی دانش آموخته روزنامه‌نگاری از دانشگاه کلمبیا هستن مطالعات استراتژیک رو در دانشگاه ابردین اسکاتلند گذروندن و دارای دکترای تاریخ از دانشگاه ویکتوریا در نیوزیلند هستند. ایشون اصلا متولد نیوزیلند هستند و البته نه ساله بودند که انقلاب ایران، انقلاب اسلامی ایران اتفاق افتاده و از همان موقع به این موضوع علاقمند شدند. کتاب سقوط بهشت یا زوال بهشت پهلوی ها و آخرین روزهای پادشاهی ایران اول شامل یه فهرستی از وقایع مهم در سالهای 58 و 59 میشه و جمعا به دو بخش اصلی و 25 فصل تقسیم شده بخش اول تحت عنوان در جستجوی ایران شامل فصلهایی به نام یا با عنوانهای شاه فره دیبا، آیت الله، جاویچاه، پیشرفت در دوران پهلوی، امپراتور نفت و آخرین روزهای پومپی و بخش دوم با نام یا با عنوان تودی شاه در برگیرنده سیر حوادث انقلاب پنجا و هفت است اجازه بدین که خوش آمد بگم به مهمان عزیزمان Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Welcome to Thank this you. program. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Okay. Uh, Dr. Cooper, uh, you were nine years old mm. when you faced the Iranian Revolution. When it, uh, I mean, wh where it was and where you were you? I was uh, in New Zealand and I remember watching on the television screen the large protests out mm. in the streets in Tehran and I think for, f for uh, many of us outside the country, outside Iran, it was, uh, it was also in a way our revolution too, it affected the whole world and so I always was interested in the story of the revolution and I always uh, hoped one day to do some scholarship on, on the subject. What was the effect at the, at the day? to New Zealand? Well, the, New Zealand w had a close relationship with Iran uh, uh, and the Shah. The, sh the Shah and Shah Banu visited New Zealand in 1974, and <coughs> both countries had very good trade relations. We had an ambassador there. And then the revolution, things changed. Khomeini actually cut off the New Zealand um, meat shipments, and yes. so New Zealand's economy nearly was nearly bankrupted. And that was resolved. But we, uh, you know, during the revolution, we also had uh, a problem with a uh, shortage of oil and fuel and we had carless days so we had days where we actually couldn't leave the house because the oil in Iran the oil workers were on strike so it affected us in a in a, a personal way okay I'm sorry I should uh, translate it in a way man as Dr. Cooper pursued them che ajab to ba englobe Iran آشنا شدی و چه جوری آشنا شدی گفت که من در نیوزیلند زندگی میکردم و نه ساله بودم که انقلاب اتفاق افتاد در 1974 شاه فقید و فره دیبا در 1974 اومدن نیوزیلند و بازدید کردن در نیوزیلند ما روابط بسیار خوبی با ایران داشتیم در دوران شاه 
و وقتی که خمینی به قدرت رسید و جمهوری اسلامی توافق پیدا کرد بسیاری چیزها عوض شد به خصوص این که خمینی دستور داد که گوشت از نیوزیلند دیگه وارد ایران نشه به خاطر حلال و حرام بودنش و از سوی دیگر به خاطر انقلاب ایران و کمبود نفت در جهان ما مشکل داشتیم در نیوزیلند و بنابراین من در همون اوان کودکی و نوجوانی متوجه این انقلاب شدم و تأثیر این انقلاب در نیوزیلند و در سراسر جهان اوکی Now, first of all, I would like to go to the book and why fall of heaven and which heaven and which fall? Oh, well, there are different ways of interpreting the, the, uh, the title. One way is to look at the mantle of kingship, Persian kingship, the far. And when the mantle of kingship is lost or removed, it's in a way, it's like the fall of heaven. So <coughs> that is very much a... a, 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 a a concept within Asian monarchy as well, that heaven and the monarchy are linked closely together. And so when the monarchy falls, also there's the fall of heaven. Um, I came up with the titles of both my books and we were looking for, my publishers wanted uh, titles that were short and would be well remembered. And it's, as an author, you always want to have a title that summarizes the story in three or four words, and as you know, that's not easy to do. Yeah, of course, as a publisher, I know very it's very difficult. difficult. Very difficult. Uh, as uh, Dr. Cooper me pursam ke chero zawal behesh, chero zawal yani sughut shah ya sughut va chero behesh. Jawabi ke midan khali jaleb va un ke ke dar buniyat hai fikri saltanati dar آسیا به خصوص وقتی که سیستم سلطنتی سقوط میکنه یا شاه سقوط میکنه این با خودش اون بهشت موعودی رو که داشته یا اون شرایطی که بوده از لحاظ خوبی با خودش میبره و این به این خاطر سقوط بهشت یا زوال بهشت نامیده شده و ناشر معمولا من ناشرا یا ادیتورا عنوان کتاب رو انتخاب میکنم ولی اینجا دکتر کوپر خودش این عنوان رو انتخاب کرده برای اینکه احساساتش رو نشون بده که دقیقا با یک جمله تمام اون چیزی که فکر میکرده که این کتاب شاملشه میتونه نمایندگی کنه و ریپرزنت کنه اوکی <coughs> okay. من سوال دیگری که میخوام از ایشون بکنم اینه که دلایل بسیاری وجود داره برای اینکه انقلاب اسلامی موفق شده و من میخوام از ایشون بپرسم که ایشون چی فکر میکنه که چجوری انقلاب موفق شده در کتابشون البته میگوین که به دلیل اینکه جنگ سر تموم شده و از یه طرف هم رادیکال اسلام اسلام رادیکال سر برابرد اوکی داتا کوپر در آر ایلات آف ریزنز دات وای اسلامیک ریولوشن پریویلد وات یو منشن این دی بوک that because the Cold War era was finished mm -hmm. and the, uh, from one side and the other side was radical Islam mm -hmm. is assaulted. Mm -hmm. Would you please uh, explore it more? Yes, I, 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 yeah. my conclusion in all the research is that um, the Shah was caught in the riptide, what I would call the riptide of history. You had the Cold War starting to wind down and then you had the revival of Islam coming up. And Iran, because of its geography and its place in the world and its, the critical role it played in the Cold War, but also within Islam, Iran was bound to be uh, deeply affected by these uh, geopolitical changes. And I think that uh, one question scholars have not looked at hard enough is how did the Shah survive for as long as he did on the throne? Because he was in power for a long time. And I think at that time in the 20th century history, that was actually really unique. 
and even within Iranian history. So um, I concluded that it would have been extremely difficult for anyone to survive for that long at that time in the Cold War, knowing what we know now with the revival of, of Islam. And uh, I'm not even sure de Gaulle could have survived the, the challenges that overwhelmed him at the end. Dr. Cooper, I'm telling you that Ketop to Zitodan, Mutavedan Kebale. به خاطر شرایط ژئوپلیتیک ایران ایران رول بسیار بسیار مهمی رو در جهان بازی میکرد و جهان بازی میکنه و اون موقع خیلی اهمیت داشت و از یه طرف از طرف دیگه شاه در قرن بیستم زمان زیادی رو به عنوان حاکم و فرمانده یه مملکت بود و یا پادشاهی مملکت بود در قرن بیستم تقریبا منحصر به فرد و همچنین از لحاظ تاریخ ایران در کتابم متسکر شدن که پنجمین پادشاه بیشترین یعنی پنج پادش، چهار پادشاه بیش از شاه فقید عمر کردن یعنی عمر سلطنتشون بوده و محمد زاشا پنجمی بوده و از این لحاظ زمان بسیار طولانی رو در قدرت بوده محمد زاشا اوکی بیفور وی گو Uh, for the rest of my question, let me tell uh, my viewers that we are going to have a book signing mm -hmm. tomorrow, a book event. Yes. Dostan Aziz, ma farda, emruz dar Los Angeles, ruzu jom az ke in barnome dar zap mishe, va farda ke shamba, saat dwe bad az zor, ve vakti Los Angeles, dwe ta chahar, Dr. Cooper dar farhang saray shakati kitab dar Westwood Los Angeles. در پروژن سکوئر خواهد بود که برای علاقمندان به این کتاب یادآوری میکنم این کتاب در نیمه اول سال 2016 یا اوایل نیمه دوم سال 2016 منتشر شده این کتاب بسیار محبوب شده در بین جامعه ایرانی به خصوص و این است که این مراسم رونمایی کتاب رو خواهش کردیم که دکتر کوپر بیاد برای شرکت کتاب و این کتاب رو برای علاقمندانش امضا کنه دلم بخواد که این مجله رو نشون بدم این مجله مجله جدول ایران شهره که ما اعلام کردیم که این کتاب منتشر شده این مجله جدول در 22 جولای سال 2016 توسط شرکت کتاب ایران شهر چاپ شده و کتاب سقوط بهشت رو نشون دادیم خود دکتر کوپرز هم البته ندیده بودن مجله رو دکتر کوپر I want to ask you a question in regards of the other factors that caused the revolution mm -hmm. or prevailing the revolution uh, and I believe one of those was the belief of the uh, Iranians to Khomeini and where it was coming from that belief uh, uh, you mentioned in your book that uh, ambassador Andrew Young said that Khomeini was a saint mm -hmm. and uh, also uh, compared uh, uh, late Shah with Adolf Eichmann. Yes. Uh, it was a really misinformation, and I would like to mm. uh, uh, sh show it in this way, that if Andrew Young, the ambassador of the United States to the United Nations, said something like that, yes. uh, how we expect Iranian regular people do not think that Khomeini is in the moon? That's a very good question. Uh, you know, we have to go back to the atmosphere in the 1970s, and there were rebellions against authority in many countries. But in Iran, uh, we had, uh, we had a, a, a misinformation campaign that was very well funded. And I think we have more, we have a greater understanding now of the propaganda from the revolutionary side. And actually, they talk about it. They've talked about how they manipulated the Western press. And I think that some people were ready to believe the worst about the Shah. 
and including in the US government. Um, they did not have, I think, all the facts that we now have when we open the archives and we have documents now, we can say that um, certain situations did not occur as, as people thought they did at the time. So that's the hindsight, the benefit of history is to look back. Of course, it doesn't help with, the, with what happened. Um, but I think that the rhetoric of the US officials at the time was very unhelpful and undermined the Shah's authority and certainly among some Iranians. من از دکتر کوپر در حقیقت سوال کردم که غیر از مسئله جنگ سرد و مسئله رادیکال اسلام رادیکال چه چی چیزی دیگه واقعا باعث شد و برای فرض گفتم که میدیای آمریکایی چه نقشی یا میدیای در حقیقت غرب چه نقشی در این زمینه داشت و چه اطلاعات غلطی در جهان پخش شد مثلا برای نمونه در کتاب اومده که سفیر امریکا در سازمان ملل متحد اندرو یانگ نشون داده که آقای شاه یعنی اعلام میکنه که خمینی یک آدم بسیار مقدسیه هولی من سنت و از طرف دیگه شاه رو مقایسه میکنه با آدولف آیشمن و میگم که یعنی سوالم این بود که خب وقتی یک همچی آدمی یعنی سفیر امریکا در سازمان ملل یک همچین گفتگوی میکنه و یه همچین بحث غلطی رو میکنه ما از آدم های ایرانیان داخل کشور آدم های معمولی که براشون پروپاگاند شده و تبلیغات شده چه انتظاری داریم که اگه نگن که ما خمینی رو در ماه دیدیم که دکتر کوپر پاسخ داد که البته کاملا درسته و متاسفانه این اطلاعات غلط رو خیلی از سازمان ها و خیلی از رسانه ها جهان رو پر کردن و همش غلط بود و الان که وقتی داریم میریم مدارک و داکیومنت ها رو نگاه میکنیم می متوجه میشیم که چه تأثیر شگرفی این اطلاعات غلط در سقوط پادشاهی ایران داشته اوکی دکتر کوپر ها باید سپر پاورز سپر پاورز یا وات دی دید Well, it's probably what they didn't do. I mean, <laughs> this, we know we, we do have a better sense, better understanding of where the Khomeini movement was getting weapons and money from. And that was coming from Gaddafi. Colonel Gaddafi in Libya was sending a lot of money to the revolutionary movement through their embassy in Beirut. And we know that uh, the revolutionary movement uh, was being supplied with weapons coming from the Eastern Bloc. So the Soviets were very much involved in that side. On the American side, I think that um, there's an argument to be made for uh, neglect, uh, ignorance, and, and certainly incompetence in the, in the US response to the outbreak of unrest in Iran in 1978. I think the US officials really did not understand their ally and they did not, it is astonishing that they had had over 100 years of diplomatic involvement in Iran at that time, but they still really did not have a solid understanding of Iranian society and Iranian history. And so I think that the Carter administration, um, in ways that were inadvertent, um, possibly in some ways that were towards the end, were more malicious, ma more malevolent, um, did not support the Shah in the way that they might have. <coughs> As Dr. Cooper said, سوپر پاور ها قدرت های بزرگ چطور؟ اونا چه نقشی داشتن؟ دو تا کوپه گفتم اونایی که یه کاری انجام دادن و اونایی که انجام ندادن ما الان میدونیم که با توجه به مدارک موجود از طریق بیروت، پایتخت لبنان و از معمر غذافی کمک میکرد به یعنی از لحاظ اسلحه و مهمات به طرفداران خمینی و اینا ما مطمئنیم و از طرف دیگه روسیه در حقیقت کشورهای کشور اون موقع اتحاد جماهیر شوروی سوسیالیستی اسلحه ها رو میفرستاد و میرسون به دست 
طرفداران خمینی و از طرف دیگه البته امریکا با توجه به صد سال همکاریش با ایران متاسفانه و روابط دیپلماتیکی داشت آنچه که باید و شاید از کشور متحد خودش ایران و رژیم متحد خودش و رژیم متحد قرب ایران همکاری نکرد و طرفتاری نکرد و پشتیبانی نکرد اوکی اباوت محمد قدافی There is still rumor, I don't know how to say it, but uh, Imam Musa Sadr, mm -hmm. uh, he was, uh, I believe, a pro-Shah. However, he was uh, a Khomeini family member, or uh, his niece, I believe, is the, mm -hmm. the uh, wife, uh, 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 Ahmad Khomeini, uh, yeah, Khomeini's uh, son. Uh, but he was, uh, uh, ally with uh, late Shah, at least at the end of the, uh, his, uh, I mean, in 1978 or mm -hmm. 1977. What's happened, Dr. Cooper? Well, that's one of the lingering mysteries of the revolution is, is what happened to Imam Musa Sada. Musa Sada left Iran for Lebanon in 1959. He had a, a, a very good working relationship with the imperial court until the mid-1970s when Lebanon's civil war erupted and Musa Sada, of course the <clears throat> Iranian revolutionaries move into Lebanon to take advantage of the chaos and to prepare for the overthrow of the regime. So Musa Sada, the Shah becomes very upset with Musa Sada at that point and the relationship ends but then in early 1978 Musa Sada reaches out to the Shah and extends an offer to help him against Khomeini. He knows Khomeini very well and he's very worried about what will happen to Iran if Khomeini comes back. And that's the critical moment where Mohammad Reza Shah accepts the offer of a dialogue and then Musa Sada disappears and is apparently eliminated by Colonel Gaddafi. And Western scholars, uh, there are two of us, we have information that the um, that Musa Sada's disappearance is very much related more to the events inside Iran and the, and the unrest than to Gaddafi himself. So in other words, we suspect that the phone call from Mohammed Beheshti came from Mohammed Beheshti and yes. that's of course Khomeini's senior ad close advisor. So the mystery surrounding Musa Sada is very much connected with this, this very uh, complicated story. از دکتر کوپر میپرسم در مورد امام موسا سعد چون در کتاب زوال بهشت به این موضوع بسیار پرداخته شده و از ارتباط ویژه‌ای که بین امام موسا سعد و شاه فقید بوده به خصوص در سال 1978 یعنی در سال 1957 و امام موسا سعد پیشنهاد همکاری و کمک میکنه به شاه فقید شاه فقید میپذیره ولی میبینیم که در آگست سال 1978 وقتی امام موسا صدر میرود به لیبی در لیبی در فکر, فکر میکنم نهم آگست اونجا ناپدید میشه و تا امروز هم ناپدیده و البته و دکتر کوپر در کتاب یادآوری میکنه که یک تلفن ارتباط تلفنی بین قذافی و آیت الله محمد بهشتی که اون زمان در حقیقت نماینده خمینی در ایران بود و بعدا رئیس شورای انقلاب شد در ایران اون به قذافی گفت که وجود امام موساسد یک وجود اضافی است و برای خمینی خطرناکه و به همین دلیل Gazafi, uno has been bored. Uh, okay, uh, do we have any new information about uh, Imam Musa Sad, how he has been killed or he has been eliminated by Gazafi regime? Well, we know, we know what the Shah was told. Uh, the Shah was told that Musa Sada was killed inside Gaddafi's residence. His 
body was entombed in concrete and then he was dropped off a helicopter into the Mediterranean. Uh, so the Shah believed at that point this was a, really a, a major setback for him because he had hoped Musa Sada would come back to uh, ally himself with the moderate clerics against Khomeini. But in recent years there have been questions as to whether Musa Saad was killed at all and it's, th there is a possibility that Colonel Gaddafi kept him alive in a prison cell for many years after the revolution and no body has been found but I, I, I understand that his family members still believe that he may be alive today. So this is a story that really still affects uh, Shia and especially the, the ulama because Musa Sada was a very prominent member of two religious clerical dynasties and so he's very revered not only in Lebanon but in parts of all through the Shia world today. Yes. As Dr. Cooper, I ask you that the story of Musa Sada was how it was. They say that we believe that Shah Faqid said that in the house or the house of Qazafi امام موسادصد رو میکشن و بعدا در بتون اونو میذارن در یک کسکیت یا محفظه بتونی و با هلیکوپتر از هلیکوپتر در دریای مدیترانه اونو میندازن پایین و این همون زمان قبل از انقلابه ولی البته بعضی از افراد فامیل ما موساست هنوز فکر میکنن که ممکنه که ما موساست زنده باشه و یه تئوری دیگه هم هست که ممکنه که قذافی برای سوالها ما موساست رو نگه داشته و این اطلاعات رو غلط رو داده و میخواسته که بعدا ممکنه از وجود ما موساست استفاده کنه بر حال ما موساست یک چهره بسیار پر اهمیتی در فرقه شیعه است و هم در لبنان و هم در کشورهای اسلامی که دارای اقلیت یا اکثریت شیعه هستم دکتر کوپرز یو ور این المصطفا یونیورسیتی این قوم فر شورت تایم یس what do you mean short time? How long? Uh, I had a short term sabbatical. Short. So uh, foreign scholars are uh, uh, allowed to come in for very, de well, it depends on the visa situation. So you don't know how long you go in for. So I had a couple of weeks there. A couple of weeks, yeah. And for example, did you have uh, the chance to uh, meet Imam Musasad family over there? No. No. Uh, no. Because uh, I don't know whether or not her, his sister is still alive in Iran. Yes, she is. I think yeah, so. Because I read the article when she was uh, at the beginning of revolution, I mean in 1979, mm -hmm. that she claimed that uh, Mamu Sassad is alive and she mm. uh, prays to Khomeini to do something for him yes. uh, and uh, save him and uh, uh, those type of uh, requests. But, uh, the, Khomeini didn't answer, never answer. No, and I think even today, Foreign Minister Zarif, when he became Foreign Minister, one of his first statements, I believe, was to, was to support a new investigation into the disappearance of Musa Saad, but nothing has happened, and it's been, what is it now, three and a half years. But the son of Colonel Gaddafi's son has still been held in a prison cell in Beirut, for his father's role in, in this abduction. And that hasn't been explained either. Nobody asked him anything? He was, I think he was three years old when Musa Sada disappeared, so I don't know what he could possibly know, but he's been <coughs> held in detention. So there's a power game going on now in the region. Musa Sada is very important, and I think Iranians really need to understand more about him. He was the senior cleric who the moderate uh, ulama hoped would become the, the Majah. He was the one who was supposed to become the senior figure in, in Shiism. Uh, and he was seen as the man who could bridge the divide between the Pahlavi state and the ulama. And he was, his personality, his education, he was perfectly placed to be that transi transition figure. But yeah. he was removed. He was removed. Uh, as uh 
آقای دکتر کوپر سوال میکنم به دلیل اینکه آقای دکتر کوپر یه مدت کوتاهی در سال 2013 در دانشگاه المصطفی قم به عنوان اسکالر به عنوان کسی پروفسور دانشگاهی اونجا بوده برای پژوهش و گفت پرسیدم آیا مثلا برای نمونه فامیل ها و خانواده امام موساد صد رو تونستیم ملاقات کنیم ایشون گفتن نه و گفتم آیا کس اینا اطلاعاتی میدم به دلیل اینکه من خودم رفتم آرشیو روزنامه اطلاعات رو در سال 1958 که نگاه میکردم دیدم خواهر امام موسا صدر از خمینی تقاضا میکنه که امام موسا صدر رو یعنی حدود یک سال بعد از اینکه ما میدونیم که امام موساسد به قتل رسیده تقاضا میکنه که امام موساسد رو نجات بده امام موساسد رو از قذافی بخواد که امام موساسد رو رها بکنه و یا اطلاعاتی در موردش بده که خمینی کاری رو انجام نمیده البته دکتر کوپر میگوید که از موقعی که آقای محمد جواد ظریف به وزارت امور خارجه رسیده تقاضا کرده یا پیشنهاد کرده که یک اینوستیگیشن جدید و یک در حقیقت نگاه بکنن ببینن که آیا میتونن سر نخی در زمینه ما مساسد به دست بیارن یا نه چون حال ما مساسد آدم بسیار پر اهمیتی همجور که گفتش در اسلام شیعه است و همچنین چیز دیگه که مطرح کردن با توجه به اینکه پسر قذافی در حال حاضر در زندان بیروت شاید بشود اطلاعات جدیدی رو در این مورد از یه آدمی مثل اون گرفت که بدونیم که چه واقعا گذشته بر امام موساست و چه ای پشت این برنامه بوده که ایران رو به زوال برسونن داتو کوپر How about the other factors the internal factors the Iranian left leftist organization like مجاهدین like چریک های فدائی and also the Iranian national front جبه ملی what's their role of this fall Well, the, uh, when the Shah decided to open up Iran's political system in early 1976, it was a, it's intended to be a gradual liberalization process, uh, the opposition groups were very suspicious. And uh, instead of joining that effort, they held back. And when they sensed that he was vulnerable, they merged with the Khomeini people to then strike a fatal blow to the regime. So I think that there was miscalculation on all sides because the people on the, uh, you know, the Shah at the end tried to build, tried to form a coalition government with National Front and they sensed that he was weak and they didn't accept the offer. They preferred to wait until the collapse. But then When Khomeini came in, he swept them from power, so they lost either way. But the story of the Shah's decision to liberalize and democratize Iran, I think, is, is not really widely understood by many Iranians at all. And he was trying to do something very difficult, uh, which was to open up the political system without the system collapsing. And of course, that, that failed. Um, I, it, he did not receive support from the United States for that. And uh, I think that Iranians think that he put these reforms in under US pressure, but actually that, that's not my, those are not my conclusions at all. The Shah started this program on his own. He felt that Iran was ready to democratize. The tragedy <coughs> is that people didn't believe him. از دکتر کوپر میپرسم که نظرش در مورد فاکتورهای داخلی چیه چی بود که چه تأثیری داشتن در پیروزی این انقلاب و مثل سازمان های چپ، سازمان مجاهدین خلق یا چریک های فدای خلق و از طرف دیگه جبهه ملی ایران دکتر کوپر اول میگه که خیلی مهمه چون همه ما فکر میکنیم که درهای 
باز و یا اعطای آزادی آزادی های بیشتر به جامعه ایران و ایران اون موقع فشار امریکا یا فشار دموکرات های امریکا بر شاه بوده در حالی که دکتر کوپ معتقده که اینطوری نیست شاه خودش این لیبرالیزیشن رو شروع کرد این دموکراتیزیشن رو شروع کرد و خاص به ایران و ایرانی این سیستم دموکراتیزی رو به وجود بیاره و داشته باشن ولی متاسفانه جامعه ایران متوجه نشدن به ویژه همین سازمان ها و این سازمان ها به جای اینکه دعوت شاه رو بپذیرن و این دموکراتیزه شدن ایران رو قبول بکنن و در فرایند سیاسی ایران شرکت بکنن متاسفانه رفتن با خمینی هم داستان شدن و دور زدن این رفرم که فوق العاده خوب بود برای اون دوران برای ایران دور زدن و رفتن با خمینی هم آواز و هم ساز شدن و بعد از این که البته انقلاب شد خمینی همه اونها رو از بین برد میدونیم تمام مجاهدین چریک های فدایی خب و جبه ملی رو و در حقیقت هم اون برو باختن و هم این برو باختن و در نهایت ایران باخت I have a theory and I believe I got it from your book that uh, in 1978 incidents mm -hmm. that we had in Iran the fatalities of civilians mm -hmm. because of the army or martial law is, wa is far less than the fatality because of the revolutionary people. Do you, do you agree with me? Yes, I mean, the fatalities were kept very low because the Shah yes. refused to issue the Tatala generals to fire on the crowds. He absolutely refused a crackdown. And it, it, it's puzzling to me that many people still say the Shah killed thousands of people when in fact, had he had a crackdown, maybe the system could have been saved for a while, but we don't know. But certainly he <coughs> refused to, um, he, he refused to have blood on his hands. And he talked about his the role as, as the father of the Iranian people was very important to him. And he kept saying, um, not a single bloody nose for an Iranian. And the generals were very frustrated because they were trying to impose martial law without using force. And that became uh, a very problematic. Yes. از آقای دکتر کوپر میپرسم که از اه, کتاب اینطوری استنباد میشه و کاملا هم به نظر من درست از لحاظ آماری و اون اینکه تعداد کسانی که اه, به دست انقلابیون در سال 57 کشته شدن ایرانی هایی که اه, با نقشه انقلابیون کشته شدن به مراتب بیش از اون چیزی بودی که اه, در پروپاگاندا و تبلیغات جمهوری اسلامی یا تبلیغاتی که در جهان غرب می شد و می گفتن که هزاران ایرانی فرض کنید در میدان جاله کشته شدن که I am telling about جاله سکوئر mm. uh, which about 78 people killed in that 86 86 people killed by and uh, I believe at the time announced by شریف امامی uh, 86, 86 and, but no, and he was right he was right and no one believed him and the revolutionary said up to 3,000 people were killed so many of the media accounts took the higher number but the Islamic Republic has admitted that the lower number is the correct one so actually we have agreement <laughs> from the, the both sides both that side. the numbers are the numbers are much lower now and that's very important for historians همین موضوع مثلا فرض کنید میدان جاله که خمینی ادعا میکرد هزاران نفر در این میدان کشته شدن شریف امامی نخوز از زیر وقت اعلام کرد که فقط 86 نفر کشته شدن و الان امروز همه موافقن هم طرف جمهوری اسلامی و هم طرف مقابل و همه موافقن که بیشتر از 86 نفر واقعا نبوده و این ارقامی که مطرح میکردن همه دروغ بوده یادآوری میکنم که فقط در موضوع 
سینما رکس آبادان یعنی فاجعه سینما رکس آبادان 400 نفر ایرانی توسط دستور علی خامنه ای و احمد خمینی و طرفداران خمینی به قتل رسیدن I've still many 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 questions <laughs> Another uh, question is uh, some Iranian scholars mm -hmm. believe that Israel had a role uh, had a role of uh, falling uh, the heaven or following the regime mm -hmm. because uh, Saddam Hussein uh, uh, late Shah did uh, had a, an agreement with yes. uh, Saddam Hussein in 1975 mm -hmm. and it was without uh, Israel permission mm -hmm. and uh, uh, at the same time uh, we Iranian uh, uh, didn't support any more court, uh, uh, Iraqi courts, and uh, mm -hmm. at the same time, Israeli helped and supported is uh, Iraqi courts, and that's why Israeli was upset, and that's why uh, revolution uh, they helped revolutionary people. That's a very <laughs> uh, no. I, that's a very simplistic interpretation, I think, and I, I don't agree with that interpretation okay. at all. Um, Israel depended on Iran at that time for, for over 40% of its oil supplies. And the Shah was a very important ally. But there were, yeah, there were tensions in the relationship, for sure, over the Kurdish operation. The Shah ended the operation, the Israelis were not happy, but the Israelis were not in a position to cause the revolution. Um, and uh, ultimately the revolution was a disaster for Israel because of course they were more isolated in the region. The Shah saw Israel and Iran as the two non-Arab states and that meant they had things in strategic areas of com in common. So uh, it, it wouldn't make sense for the Israelis to <laughs> pull something like that <laughs> off. Thank you. As I said, Dr. Cooper, I would ask that some of the Iranians have said that Israel سبب شد که خمینی به قدرت برسه سپورت و پشتیبانی خودش رو از شاه برداشت دلیلشون هم اینه که میگوین که شاه شاه فقید در سال 1975 با صدام حسین وقتی موافقت نامه الجزایر رو امضا کرد بدون موافقت اسرائیل بود و اسرائیلی ها دلیل دومیش هم این بود که هم اسرائیل و هم شاه فقید یا ایران به کورت های عراق کمک میکردند و چون شاه ایران پشتیبانیش رو از کورت های عراق برداشت به همین دلیل اسرائیلی ها ناراحت شدند و به همین در مجموع باعث شد که اسرائیلی ها پشتیبانی ایشون رو از شاه بردارن و به انقلابیون کمک بکنن دکتر کوپر معتقده که صد درصد این غلطه به دلیل اینکه در اون دوران ایران و اسرائیل دو متحد واقعی با هم دیگه بودن دو تنها دو کشور غیر عرب در خاورمیانه بودن و در نتیجه ممکنه که تنشی در روابطشون بود یا با هم دیگه اختلافاتی داشتن ولی هرگز اسرائیل در این ماجرا هیچ گونه دخالتی نداشته و عملا هم می‌بینیم که اینطوری نبوده چرا که تا روز 22 بهمن سفارت یا کنسولگری اسرائیل در تهران باز بود و خود اونها هم شوکه شدند و در حقیقت شاک بودند as in Mojaro Nogahoni. We have about five minutes, uh, uh, Dr. Cooper, and I want to ask you a very hard question. What do you think the future of Iran? Oh, I want to... Uh, that is very hard. ...quoted from your book. Uh, when Late Shaw was in Cairo, mm and Feridun Javadi asked him his feeling toward Iran. 
He responded, Iran is Iran. Iran means land, people, and history. Then, if this phrase is correct, then how do you characterize the future of Iran? Well, I think he was talking about eternal Iran, Iran that is uh, uh, a never-ending concept of yeah. Iran and the Iranian people and the Iranian nation. And I, I found that to be a, an incredibly moving statement that he made near the end when he was, he was dying. I think that my understanding is that he had, despite the rejection at the hands of so many Iranians, he had confidence in the Iranian people that eventually they would come out of this and they would understand that um, what he tried to do for the country and that they would have, uh, at the end of the day, history would look back on his period uh, more positively than people did in 1979. And I think that he believed that uh, the people coming into power would probably um, not last long and eventually they too would fall in the tradition of Iranian history, which of course we have so many dynasties coming through the history. As uh, Dr. Cooper said, I would like to ask them what is going on in Iran. And I would like to ask them to the end of the book. In the end of the book, Feridun Javadi asks Shah Faqir, what is going on in Iran? What is going on in Iran? با ایرانی ها اون میگه که ایران ایرانه ایران معنیش یعنی سرزمین ایران ایران معنیش یعنی مردم ایران و ایران معنیش اینه که تاریخ ایران و دکتر کوپر جواب میده که این کاملا درسته و ایران هرگز نمی میره ایران هرگز ممکن سلسله های بسیاری میان و میروند ولی ایران میماند هرگز هم شاه با اینکه کم لطفی بسیار از طرف ایرانی ها دید ولی اعتمادش و ایمانش رو به مردم خودش از دست نداد Thank you very much Dr. Cooper Thank you uh, We will be tomorrow yes. at Kitab Bookstore I look forward to it uh, You're welcome uh, I believe by uh, myself, by all of my staff, and also by the Iranian community here Thank in you. Los Angeles. ما فردا هم جوری که اول برنامه خدمتون گفتم در خدمت آقای دکتر کوپر خواهیم بود برای مراسم رونمایی از کتاب The Fall of Heaven و ایشون اونجا تشریف دارن به پرسش ها و پرسش های شما پاسخ خواهند داد ساعت دو بعد از دور فردا. در شرکت کتاب. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.